All right, hello. Um, I want to thank Dr. Turing for giving me this opportunity to talk about how physics relates to some practical aspects in medicine. And what we're going to be talking about is diffusion across uh, the lung into the blood and then maybe some concepts of work and then any other questions that, that may come up. So diffusion is something that we use all the time in medicine and uh, we look at for patients who are doing well and, and not doing so well. And so diffusion is a function of how much air gets from the alveolar space. So this is the lung itself. Um, so air fills the alveolar space. And then there's a thin membrane here typically that is the lung tissue itself. And then below that is another membrane which is the uh, endothelium of the blood vessel. And within that blood vessel are red blood cells and those red blood cells are carrying hemoglobin that then absorb uh, gases. And the idea is that as blood comes back from the body, the partial pressure of CO2, which is generated from work done in the muscle itself, is at very high partial pressure. And the level of oxygen, the partial pressure for oxygen is very low. And the reason is the muscles have used up, the mitochondria have used up that oxygen and produced CO2. So because of that, the alveolar pressure, it's atmospheric partial pressures of CO2 and oxygen. So the partial pressure of oxygen is very high. Partial pressure of CO2 is low. And just based on that, the gases exchange um, through diffusion across that membrane. One of the things that's, that nature has provided as an advantage is that hemoglobin allows the partial pressure of oxygen uh, to go up more than the solubility that's in the, the blood vessel itself. So it's able to extract out a lot more oxygen that can deliver then to the tissues and then provide tissues with, with the oxygen that's, that's needed. So the way this is uh, relevant is patients who have disease um, there's several things that can happen. One, they can have less red blood cells. So the ability to pull oxygen out of the lung is, is decreased. Another thing that can happen is they can get what's called pulmonary fibrosis, where you have thickening of this membrane. And when this membrane is thickened, the ability to fuse across that membrane is reduced. And so they have a hard time getting oxygen in or CO2 eliminated. Or there can be a problem with blood vessels in that they could be um, blocked or there could be less blood vessels or um, there can be a problem with the alveolar, the spaces being too big. And so the surface uh, area of the lung versus the blood vessels is reduced so you don't get good exchange. So those are things that can happen with with diffusion, and it all is based on the partial pressures that are existing in these two different compartments. Then when it comes to work, one of the things that we look at, at with, with work is how well, P, um, the, so we use a PV curve, so pressure and volume, and I know Dr. Turing told me this is flipped to what you guys are used to, but uh, this is the way we tend to, to look at it. So the lung responds to an increase in air. So you take a big deep breath in. And initially it takes a lot of pressure to bring that air in. And then the lung then takes uh, more volume in easily. And then on expiration, you see a hysteresis and it goes down like this. And the reason this happens, there's a couple of reasons, but one of the main reasons is the alveoli there takes some work to open those alveoli up. And so all of this pressure here is required to open those things up. And then once they're inflated, the work is very, is very minimal. And so you get a lot of volume for very little change in so pressure. Like a balloon. Like a balloon, right. So a very stiff balloon, you try to blow it up, it won't blow up, and all of a sudden it just breaks open. Now one of the things that, um, helps this relationship is actually surfactant in the lung. And so surfactant is basically soap and it reduces the surface tension. So if you think about a, 
a small little alveolus and there's you know there's you know two to the 23 alveoli in the lungs so that's a lot of a lot of alveoli and they're all clustered together and when they're really small and tight they're hard to blow up if there wasn't surfactant they'd be even stiffer they'd be even even harder to break up and so the idea is that the soap bubbles kind of line the alveoli and make it easy for those alveoli to slide back and forth from each other. And so it makes it a lot easier to, to open those up. There are some diseases where you see a lack of surfactant and what will happen is that pressure volume curve will be like this. So very, very tight. And it requires a tremendous amount of work just to open up that, that lung. Um, another thing you can look at with work, and I don't know if this is something you guys have, have discussed, but if you look at um, there's two different types of work. There is airway resistance work and there is elastic work. And so this is airways resistance and this is elastance. So elastance is 1 over compliance and that is a change in pressure over a change in volume. Okay, so how much pressure does it take to then get that, that change in volume? And that's your elastance work. And then there's airways resistance, and airways resistance is basically elastance per unit time. So it's the pressure required to give a given flow or volume per unit time. And so airways resistance and elastance. As your respiratory rate increases, then the, the function of resistance goes up. And as your, your respiratory rate goes up, the elastance, the amount of work it takes to open that lung actually goes down a little bit. And so the total work of breathing is a function of the uh, addition of these two together. Okay, so this is total work of breathing. The reason that's important is when you look at various diseases. So if you have someone who has very stiff lungs, then they're going to have a hard time early on. Their elastance is going to go up with a stiff lung. And so their total work of breathing is going to be much higher early on at lower respiratory rates and then get a little bit easier and then go back up again because your airway resistance starts coming back up again. So in someone who has stiff lungs, elastance is higher, they like to breathe at a little bit higher respiratory rate compared to someone who's normal. And the converse is true. If someone has, say, asthma, emphysema, where there's an airways resistance problem, then their airways resistance is very high. Their elastance tends to be lower. And so their work of breathing is going to be the lowest early, early in the lower respiratory rates. And so this is just a function of something we see clinically all the time, where those patients who have stiff lungs, they like to breathe faster than normal. Those who have asthma, emphysema, they like to breathe slower. And the faster someone with asthma breathes, that work gets really, really high. It makes it very difficult for them to breathe. So these are real, you know, real life examples of uh, you know, basic phys physics principles. What's, Question? The What's the average rate of breathing? So the average rate of breathing is around 18, 16 to 18. And so someone who has asthma or emphysema, they may breathe at 12, 10, 12. Someone who has restrictive lung disease, they may be breathing at, at 20, 25, at, at, you know, baseline rest. Permanent. Yeah, permanent, exactly. As an undergrad, what was your experience of physics like? As an undergrad. Oh, right, okay, sure. So as an undergrad, I was actually a, a physics major, biophysics uh, sub, you know, uh, uh, major, and um, I loved I loved physics. I, I just it was it was the best time. Um, I was I did a lot of upper division physics. I was thinking about doing physics in in, uh, in graduate school, and just realized that although I was okay at math, I was not as good at math as 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 my colleagues who were going into graduate school. And I, I've always wanted to be a doctor. So, so for t those two reasons, I, I didn't go in. But um, it helps me now for, um, 
uh, for the clinical uh, work that I do, it, you know, just having that background, that extensive background in physics is really uh, beneficial.